This um, uh, diagram is now starting to look familiar. What I've done is I've replaced acetylcholine with GABA. So in the same way, GABA can be packaged into vesicles um, in response to an action potential coming in, calcium coming down its concentration gradient, increasing intracellular calcium triggers the fusion of vesicles with the presynaptic membrane. And in this case, GABA is released. GABA can also interact with two different types of receptors. In this case, both of them are always inhibitory. So this is why we say that GABA is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABA A receptors have an ion channel. GABA B receptors are these G protein coupled receptors, which as I said, you'll find out about in other parts of the course. In this case, the reason that the ion channel is inhibitory and not excitatory is because instead of letting sodium down the concentration gradient, a positively charged ion to enter the cell, the GABA receptor is um, selective for an anion chloride, negatively charged anion. So instead of positive um, um, charge entering the cell, negative charge enters. So instead of depolarization, we get hyperpolarization, and that's the basis of why GABA is a inhibitory neurotransmitter at these what we call GABA A receptors. These ones are called GABA B receptors. So hopefully you can see um, generally neurotransmission neurotransmitter release is very similar. The difference is dictated by action on these postsynaptic receptors. Here, these receptors are inhibitory rather than excitatory. And we'll describe maybe in a little bit of detail and compare and contrast why these are inhibitory. Hopefully you can see it from this slide already um, on the next slide. So essentially, this is our GABA A receptor. Um, as with the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the get at uh, rest in the inactive state, the gate is closed. In this case, we get GABA that is going to go in and bind into its binding site on the extracellular side of the GABA A receptor. So binding now opens the gate. As I said before, chloride um, moves across the membrane and makes the inside of the cell more negative. So chloride entry makes it more negative. It hyperpolarizes the postsynaptic membrane instead of depolarizing it if a positively charged um, species such as a sodium ion through the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor comes in, as we saw in the previous screencast. So this hyperpolarization causes an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, an IPSP, which we talked about before. IPSPs, because they're inhibitory, they inhibit action potential generation, so they try and keep the cell below that threshold that will fire an action potential. So again, hopefully you can see from this that inhibitory postsynaptic potentials and indeed excitatory postsynaptic potentials are different to the presynaptic action potential. So let's again consider that with this again electrophysiological trace. So what we've um, done here is probably put an electrode into our presynaptic neuron and recorded an action potential. It looks very similar to the, all the previous action potentials that we've seen before. And we've put another electrode in this postsynaptic neuron and we're recording this time an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And you should see immediately that the inhibitory postsynaptic potential can be distinguished between the excitatory postsynaptic potential in that it's causing a hyperpolarization. It goes in this negative direction. Again, it has this very similar or identical um, uh, properties to the EPSP, but obviously one difference is that it's just in a different direction. But the properties are identical in terms of the fact that they're graded, they're temporal, and they can summate. And again, just to remind you, if you can't remember from the previous screencast, graded means that they can change in amplitude. So although we're only just showing one IPSP, uh, equally we could show one that would be slightly bigger, slightly smaller, unlike the action potential. They're temporal, they decay with time quite slowly, again, compared to the very rapid standard decay of our action potential. And they can summate, they can add together. As I said, we've only shown one here, but if you want to look at summation, you can look at the previous slide 
for EPSPs and, and maybe the next couple of slides as well where we talk about um, uh, synaptic integration. So that's a typical inhibitory synapse. You can see hopefully that by hyperpolarizing the cell, what we'll tend to do is prevent this threshold being reached. So again, maybe this is shown on this, this diagram here. Here's our resting neuron again, sitting around about minus 65. Here we've got an inhibitory input. Chloride comes in and this inside of the cell gets more and more negative compared. So minus 65 goes down to minus 70. Um, and the more and more chloride that comes in, the more and more negative this will become. And the tendency will be not to fire an action potential here at the axon hillock or the axon initial segment, as it's called in, in some textbooks. And the action potential will not fire and it will not uh, generate an action potential at the next uh, synapse. So maybe this is just summarized here. Chloride influx via inhibitory um, receptors. Yeah, and again, maybe just for completeness here, sometimes um, in response to chloride coming in, you get um, um, a removal, an efflux of uh, potassium, which again makes the inside more and more negative, results in a neuron that's inhibited and so inhibits the generation of the next action potential. So let's consider this in terms of um, this synaptic integration. So what we've got here now is we've combined the, the previous uh, two diagrams, if you like, to show you both excitatory, shown in plus, these green neurons A and B, and an inhibitory um, input into this postsynaptic neuron. So again, maybe an important uh, take home message is we shouldn't think about neurons as having a input just from one source. Neurons have inputs from uh, thousands of different presynaptic neurons and the postsynaptic neuron must integrate all of the signals from all of the postsynaptic neurons, uh, presynaptic neurons, sorry. Here we simplified it to excitatory and one inhibitory and decide whether it's going to fire or not whether it's going to go over the threshold and fire an action potential in this axon hillock area. So again, we've used electrophysiology. We've said that in we've put an electrode into post uh, presynaptic neuron A and we can record that it's um, it, it's uh, two action potentials have been generated and in we've put another electrode in um, um, presynaptic neuron C and uh, recorded um, another input here, another action potential. We can see that all these action potentials look identical because they're all or nothing. What we can see here is the response. So again, maybe we've put an electrode in this postsynaptic neuron and recorded what happens. So this um, action potential has generated this EPSP, this action potential in the uh, in the inhibitory neuron has generated this negative inhibitory IPSP. If we add them to um, maybe a, another input here has generated an EPSP on top of the IPSP. What we should see here is if we've got this threshold line here, if there's more inhibition coming in, it's going to keep the um, it's going to keep the potential below the line. The more excitation that comes in is going to put the um, neuron above or the, the um, potential above the firing threshold. And the more excitation we get, the more sodium in this case coming in compared to chloride coming in is going to be able to generate a full blown action potential. So that's the concept of somatic integration. Maybe just to put that into words. A neuron receives both excitatory and inhibitory inputs. A major function is to integrate these signals and decide whether to fire or not, whether to signal to the next neuron or muscle or gland or not generate another action potential. OK, so hopefully you can see that. Um, what I'll do is I'll put an activity related um, and a couple of questions related to excitatory and inhibitory um, neurotransmission and summation. So make sure that you have a look at that. Um, I'll also post a 
short screencast that um, explains the answers to that activity as well. Um, what I'll probably do is I'll give you a couple of um, a couple of weeks maybe to have a look at the um, at the questions and see if you can answer them. Then I'll release the answers um, a bit later in, ter in the term. So let's um, summarise the screencasts five, six and seven, which were on chemical synapses and receptors. So hopefully you've um, you now be able, one of the learning aims is to be able to describe synaptic transmission. So this is neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic cell by this calcium dependent process. So we've described it for acetylcholine and GABA in, um, in some detail. Neurotransmitters bind to postsynaptic receptors to cause a short chain, a short lived change to excitability of the postsynaptic cell. So if you've got an excitatory neurotransmitter, we gave you the example of acetylcholine, it can cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential, and this is going to activate the postsynaptic cell. It's going to tend to generate an, the next action potential. Inhibitory neurotransmitters such as GABA cause inhibitory postsynaptic potentials and inhibit the postsynaptic cell, inhibit the firing of the next um, action potential. The way that we decide whether an action potential or the way the neuron decides whether an action potential is going to be fired or not is to do with synaptic uh, integration or cellular integration. Neurons summate the excitatory and inhibitory inputs. The relative balance determines if the neuron will fire or not.